Okay, so we're now recording. Um, so the first lightning poster session for R2R is just starting. And I'm very pleased to welcome Sally Wilson um, to come and do the, the first session on driving cultural change for societal impact. Sally, please take it away. Thank you. The collective aim of the UN SDGs is to leave no one behind. COVID-19 and the disparities highlighted around gender, race and social class demonstrate the importance of researchers and publishers in together driving that societal change. Our recent Emerald Cultural Survey looked at the challenges to change, what researchers believe are the priorities for making change happen and their expectations of publishers. Outdated institutional management practices and policies, 59% topped the list of pressures, followed by pressure to publish at 58%. More than one in 10 said these pressures were affecting sleep patterns, mental and physical health, and personal relationships. Inadequate funding and resources for research were all cited as key issues. Some answers revealed gender disparity within academia. 45% of males said their institutions provided equal opportunities, but only a third of females agreed the same. There are also regional variations with Indian researchers most content in their roles, saying nearly half had never considered leaving academia, compared to 70% of Australian and 23% of North American researchers saying they thought about it all the time. Negative impacts were felt strongly at the six to 10 year post-grad career stage, although nearly one in 10 struggled with sleep patterns in the first five years of academic research. Impacts of uh, COVID and remote working. It was encouraging to see that nearly half of researchers, 48% felt supported by their manager although three in 10 cited creating clear separation of home life and work life while being at home as the single biggest challenge. When asked to describe their institution's culture, survey respondents revealed a growing view that academia's culture and incentive structures needed to change. Key areas were practices and policies towards equality, diversity and inclusion, particularly around hiring and promotion and incentive structures and ranking systems. The good news is that this practice is being challenged and there has been a push towards structures that assess and reward researchers according to the quality of their contributions and the broader impacts of their work. We then asked what the main problems were with how research was being done today. Again, it revealed inequalities based on career stage, with 51% feeling that funding was only available to established researchers, while 37% challenged incentives that focused on publication over research output. Respondents also highlighted a lack of opportunities to collaborate or work differently, for example, with different disciplines at 35% or collaboration with practice at 37%. Finally, we asked about the publisher's responsibility and you can see the responses there. I'm gonna cover some of the things we're doing at Emerald, but clearly we as publishers have a responsibility to not prop up academia's current incentive structure that we all benefit from. Yet we also know that scholarly publishing often mirrors academia in terms of its lack of diversity. As publishers, if we are to develop the right products for a diverse audience, we must challenge our own recruitment practices um, to ensure that we have a diverse workforce to effectively support collaboration and co-creation. In addition to signing DORA, we have also signed the SDG Publisher Compact and we're embedding this into our group-wide responsible business strategy and putting collaboration and co-creation at the heart. We continue to champion EDI at Emerald through Stride, an internal program that promotes inclusivity. And we're also part of a cross-industry initiative organized by the RSC on action and inclusivity in scholarly publishing, where we develop and share best practice. We've committed to only taking part in conferences with diverse panels, and we've been working with uh, iNorm's Research Evaluation Group to understand how we can achieve greater diversity through our editorial boards. We've also worked hard to improve our discoverability on our Emerald Insight platform, and we'll be looking at better signposting research content linked to SDGs. Our Emerald Open Research Platform provides waivers for researchers for low and middle income countries and we signed the Welcome Trust Pledge to put COVID content in front of the paywall for the term of the pandemic. We also funded a £20,000 open research COVID collection. Finally, we're working with researchers on services and metrics that support and demonstrate research impact and new types of content to disseminate research beyond the article and beyond academia. Thank you for listening. So hopefully we've got some time for questions. 
Hi, so um, thank you very much, Sally. That was that was really interesting and uh, well done keeping to time. Um, is there anybody who would like to either put their hand up or um, stick something in chat um, to ask questions immediately? Um, while you're thinking, I have a question, mm -hmm. which which is, um, I mean, you talk about the things that you're 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 bringing in, um, you know, new innovations, new new ways to work. Um, do you um, ever encounter resistance? Are there people for whom this is uncomfortable or unwelcome? I think that it was quite interesting when we did a recent um, survey of our editors to find out their views to um, diversity and, and and the topic of quotas does come up and and um, that's something that I know feel people feel uncomfortable about and we haven't necessarily said that we're going to set any quotas. I think the biggest challenge to actually facing into um, having more diverse, for example, editorial boards is data and data collection. Um, so when discussing with um, our editors, I think there is a reluctance to have quotas, but there is support of a commitment. So a commitment to say that the editors on this journal um, want to observe um, behaviours and practices that encourage EDI. And so that's something that we're, we're continuing to discuss with our editors to understand what those next steps are. Okay. So again, keeping an eye out on the chat. In the meantime, um, do you have a sense of um, uh, there ever being, if you like, enough um, of inclusion? Um, is there is there a point at which you think, yes, we've now reached a point where we're you know we're happy, we don't need to do anything more kind of conscious because the the, the system has has corrected itself. I, I don't think so because I think probably it's always changing. The landscape is always changing. I think um, as publishers, uh, sometimes we focus on the things that may be easiest to measure first without considering other areas of inclusivity like ableism. So I don't think we'll ever solve the problem. I think we, it's an ongoing conversation and an ongoing awareness that we all have a responsibility to observe and take part in. Right. So basically, it'll be an area that continues to mature. And so there's always, it always makes sense to, to engage. I guess, and, and we, can all, we can all um, benefit from that. Okay, um, I'm just, oh yes, we do have some some um, questions. We've got one in the chat now. So um, from N Ramsey, does GDPR pose issues for collecting data that need to measure diversity and inclusion? Yes, <laughs> GDPR does. Um, uh, and, and, and also just people's personal um, responsibility responsibility or ability or comfort in sharing their data as well so i think you know you have have the legal requirements around gdpr and and obviously any data we collect we want to make sure we use responsibility and we don't attribute to a source so all of our data is anonymized and not stored alongside uh, people's um sort of names and affiliations but i think also we just have to be aware that for some people uh wherever they are in the world that, that there may not be that level of comfort to actually share their data or they may not want to share their data for fear of it being used in a tokenistic way. So I think, you know, I think data is the biggest challenge for us in terms of, um, you know, data collection, I think is the biggest challenge to try and drive some, some changes. So I think, you know, I don't think we should get hung up on the data. I think we need to really think about um, policies, procedures and behaviours and that ongoing discussion. Okay, now thank you for tying that, that up, Sally. Um, I think this is also a really good way of kicking off the, this session, given the, the, the plenary we've, we've actually just had. So, um, a reminder to everybody that the conversation continues, and you can, you can ping Sally on um, the on-air um, platform, and you've also got her contact details there, so, so do feel free to carry on the conversation. But first, Sally, could you um, stop sharing so that Tiberius can, can tee up? And we will come to our, our next... There we go. Our next lightning poster. Hello everyone, this is Tiberius Signat from Scientific Knowledge uh, Services. And I've been given the opportunity to have a lightning poster. And thank you uh, very much for organizing all the things and for attending this uh, networking lightning poster sessions. So in the chat, you have the abstract of my poster. I hope that's helpful to warm up. And you also have a link with a video that I'm going to, to show so that you have this video after the lightning poster. So my, um, my lightning poster is about uh, tracking and persuading in a content industry like scholarly communication uh, industry. It's not 
uh, only about the activity of, uh, I want to make clear of publishers, but it's the, the activity that all stakeholders could have in scholarly communication arena. So that being said, I invite you for two and a half minutes to watch a video. I hope it works. And of course, some, where is the video now? Uh, yeah, no. Well, it was here. So I'll uh, share my desktop then. And I'll go to this way to the video. I hope, I hope you see my video now. And you hear the sound. So I hope the sound was there. And the, it the, was. the yep. thing is, yeah, the thing is that in um, not necessarily in scholarly communication industry, but in content industry, it's very common to have um, algorithms employed to persuade, to persuade readers to stay longer and to come back sooner, to persuade authors. To, to write more, to contribute more, and to, to become champions of dissemination of their own work. So I think it's time to, to analyze if this is a situation that we want to state in scholarly communication. I think we need to understand the implications. Therefore, my lightning poster here, and I'm looking for your questions, if you have. If the message that I try to sent to you via a video was understandable or was suggesting enough for inviting you for questions. Okay, so um, yeah, people do put your questions in, in the chat and we'll read them out as long as there's time. Um, but in the meantime, I mean, Tiberius, how much of a problem do you think this already is? 
for, for people and we, we don't actually know about it? Well, I, I, think, it's, um, I think it's a problem um, that the thing that the data, personal data is already collected. Um, some publishers uh, are using uh, different technologies for, uh, for their apps and for their um, web pages to collect the data. I'm not sure at this point if they have a specific intent with that data or is simple because this is how the, the pages is built, but uh, a good amount of data is collected through um, personal accounts. Then there are also a number of cookies. It depends from uh, publisher to publishers, from, from library to library, from funder to funder, because once again, this is not a, a problem of publishers, uh, where some trackers are let on by default. So a part of the information that is collected in the, in the personal accounts that we have with several platforms are the inform is the information which is collected through trackers, through cookies to put it simple. It's not clear the intent for this information, but combined this information could help persuasive algorithms. And I think once again, we need to have a serious debate if persuasion algorithms are welcome in scholarly communication industry. Okay, um, yeah, and that, that the questions are, are starting to flood through as well. So from Frank Norman, we've got, do we need our own algorithms to help us fend off the persuaders algorithms? Well, that's, that's a very interesting, so could be a solution, of course. I think I'm, um, I'm, I'm not very much in favor of mandates or state interventions and things like this, but I think we miss certain regulations in the digital space. So one thing is to, to, create, um, to, to create a solution which is protecting us through the, uh, the way Frank is suggesting by having an algorithm to protect against persuasive non-human algorithms. The other solution is to try to regulate a bit the use of non-human algorithms in, uh, in such techniques. Okay, and actually perhaps following on from that, Katrina McCallum has, has asked, and this came up actually with the, the first poster, is how does GDPR affect the data that publishers can collect and has it made a difference? Thank you, Katrina. I, I think theoretically it makes a difference, but if you look to many such web pages, you will see now, and this is quite new, I, I, I think it's no longer than six months, you see next to GDPR and the consent that is requested from users to accept or, or decline, you see legitimate interest. And for many, many uh, participants in scholarly communication, you see so something which they claim or the website uh, builder is claiming because some, some of them are using a solution for creating their website. It's a legitimate interest. So apparently some people think it's their legitimate interest to collect my data without my consent because they need it for their own uh, activity. So in that sense, for the last six months, GDPR is starting to fade away from its intended consequences. Oh, all right, so watch this so space watch for the questions. Watch legitimate interest space, <laughs> and you will mm. be surprised. Go to Doodle, for example, and watch the legitimate interest Doodle is raising. Okay, um, and actually, uh, I think there's also a question of, of um, how does research data, as opposed to personal data, interact with this? But I, I'm not sure we're going to have time to go into well, that, unless there's something you can say quickly. Yes, I, I think the research data is something which is, is going to improve the algorithms. I, because I study this in a research project, in a quite large research project, and I see the research data is able to refine the use of personal data, which is coming uh, in these algorithms from, from different sources. So what I think is don't simply think that research data could be uh, associated with a CC BY license and put it open in the wild. I think we, we need to be more, much more conscious about the way, how we share the research data because it could actually serve, serve some negative purposes. So we should be very careful how we share the data. Mm, so tread with caution, proceed tread with caution. care. Yes, and be anticip anticipative. Uh, it's, it's not something that we need to act now, I think. Right, yes. actually, there's a last question coming through. I don't know if we can just try and squeeze it in. How can publishers abstain from this when they line in an online environment where cookies are collected and I, used I, by everyone? 
Yeah, I read the question. I yep. think publishers at this moment are much more oh, tempted Lord, sorry. <laughs> to, to use to use uh, such uh, persuasive algorithms than not. So uh, uh, the best way is to engage with publishers, but again, also with funders, also with others that are going are using research our, our outputs to engage with them and have a, a serious conversation. Simply telling to others what not to do simply telling others what they need to change in order to satisfy myself or ourselves is not a good idea. The best idea is to engage, to create the necessary transparency and to understand different needs. So I think a strong engagement is a solution instead of telling others what to do or what not to do. Okay, well, thank you so much, Tiberius. And also thank you, thank you to, to, to Sally. That, that was really you know, exciting and well encapsulated and it, it, it counted along very, very nicely. So everybody- Click the link and watch the video. <laughs> yes, Sorry. put the links. Um, please reach out to, to either Sally or Tiberius if you've got any further questions. There's lots of opportunities to do that. And in the meantime, I um, invite you all to go back to the plenary and see some inter an interesting interview um, for, to a Chinese researcher. By Nick Goncharov. Thank you. Bye.